Absolutely, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, it's, uh, as everyone is saying, a be beautiful day, but a really wonderful conference, and I've, I've, uh, I've, I've learned uh, quite a bit this morning and this afternoon. Uh, so, um, as you all know, during uh, embryonic development, the induction of uh, bone formation is, um, is very highly regulated, both where and when bone forms, in order for skeletal elements to, um, to form as, as they need to. Um, after birth, bone formation is normally limited to uh, uh, regeneration and repair of, uh, of the skeleton uh, during, uh, in, in the result, as a result of uh, injury or, or fracture. Uh, and this also is a process that is very, very precisely regulated. But there are... Can I interrupt you for just yeah. one second? Did it happen? Thank you. Technical difficulties. There you go. Sorry about that. Good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so um, there are um, uh, things that could go wrong if they, uh, in um, as uh, everything else in, in life. If it can go right, it can also go wrong. And there are uh, pathological events that can alter the uh, usual processes of, um, of when and where uh, bone forms. Um, and um, I'm going to... Um, be telling you about two genetic diseases that we study in, the, in my research group uh, to study this uh, pathological uh, process of uh, fo forming bone in uh, abnormal uh, places. And, and this process of extraskeletal bone formation is known as uh, heterotopic ossification, and that's a term that, uh, that I'll use uh, frequently throughout my talk. Uh, and it only refers to bone that forms outside of the normal skeleton. Uh, the bone that forms in the diseases that I'll be telling you about uh, is uh, distinct from ectopic calcification. This uh, actually is uh, true bone and bone cells, uh, bone cell differentiation, uh, both cartilage and, uh, and osteoblasts that form during this process. Uh, uh, in, uh, heterotopic ossification can form either by an endochondral uh, process or by an intramembranous bone forming process. Um, and um, these really are diseases of um, uh, abnormal induction of bone formation, so a misregulation of the induction of, uh, of the process. Uh, outside of uh, genetic diseases and the diseases that I'll be telling you about, uh, heterotopic ossification is actually a fairly common occurrence and is most frequently associated with very severe tissue trauma, such as central nervous uh, system uh, injury, uh, hip replacement surgery, uh, uh, deep tissue burns, um, and also uh, high impact uh, injuries and, and amputations, and has in many cases uh, been associated uh, with uh, war-related injuries. Um, a few examples of uh, heterotopic ossification are, are shown here, um, and you can see the um, heterotopic bone that is forming here. This is a result of uh, a, a deep tissue uh, burn. This is a, um, uh, uh, a, um, a shoulder uh, surgery that has resulted in uh, ossification. And uh, this is a limb amputation uh, from uh, a war-induced, a war-related uh, blast injury uh, that necessitated an uh, amputation. And you can see the extensive bone that has formed. Um, and uh, in situations like this, it's uh, very difficult, if not impossible, to, um, to fit a prosthetic device. Uh, heterotopic ossification uh, impairs uh, uh, range of motion, but is also associated with very severe pain, uh, pressure ulcer, ulcers, and as, as I said, limitations uh, to use as uh, prosthetics. And the treatment options currently um, are, are fairly limited. Uh, very little is understood about this process and what regulates the process of uh, bone formation um, outside of the skeleton. Uh, though you can um, 
you know, probably readily think that um, you, there must be an inducing event that stimulates the process uh, to begin. Uh, osteoprogenitor cells need to be recruited to participate in the process. And there has to be a conducive tissue environment, an environment that's going to support the osteogenic cells and the progenitor cells to differentiate and develop into uh, a bone tissue. Uh, genetic diseases, and, and you know, for, the, for this audience, I don't think there's any uh, need to, um, uh, to describe the value of studying genetic diseases. They identify specific uh, targets, specific uh, uh, pathways and cellular processes that are uh, directly involved in regulating processes like bone formation and the induction of, uh, of bone formation. And uh, as I've mentioned, um, we study two rare genetic diseases in, uh, in our research group, um, and I'm going to tell you about both of them today. I'm not going to be, uh, give you a comprehensive uh, picture of the diseases and, and what we know, uh, but uh, my goal is to uh, describe both of those to you and um, uh, let you see the similarities and the differences between these two diseases, and hopefully um, you will relate uh, what we are studying in our diseases to things that, that you are doing uh, in your own work and perhaps find overlapping therapeutic strategies or other information uh, to understand uh, these disorders. So um, uh, both uh, FOP, fiber dysplasia ossificans progressiva, and progressive osseous heteroplasia um, form extensive heterotopic ossification that begins during childhood. Uh, the bone formation is progressive and uh, uh, extends and continues throughout the life of the individual. Uh, both of these diseases are caused by single gene mutations, although the mutation in each of the two diseases affects different signaling pathways. Uh, both diseases can be inherited by uh, autosomal dominant transmission. However, uh, in most cases, uh, the, case, the cases and the patients that we know are the result of spontaneous new mutations because the diseases are uh, so debilitating, we rarely see them uh, being inherited through families. So uh, again, in both diseases, uh, similarities that uh, new bone formation is induced de novo, independently of the existing skeleton. The stages and uh, how bone formation progresses appears to be normal, basically following the same bone formation process that occurs during embryonic skeletal development. But it's the improper induction, the signals that are uh, inducing cells and tissues uh, to initiate this uh, formation of, uh, of the bone tissue. In other words, normal bone is forming in the wrong place at the wrong time. So uh, uh, when we started this work, a key focus has been, had been to identify the genes that are mutated in these diseases. Once we uh, recognized that they were genetic diseases, we knew that if we could uh, identify the, um, the particular um, uh, mutations and, and genetic targets, the cell signaling pathways, that we could better understand this process. So uh, I'll talk first about uh, fiber dysplasia ossificans progressiva, which is the disease that uh, we've been uh, studying for the longest and, uh, and really initiated uh, this, this work by our group. Uh, it's a rare disorder, um, as I said, of, of uh, heterotopic ossification. Uh, the population frequency is roughly about one in two million. Uh, can be autosomal dominant, but mostly sporadic. And the um, first indication that a person has FOP uh, is uh, Im immediately at birth uh, by the presence of uh, these uh, toe malformations that you can see here and are the, uh, the earliest sign that a person has, has FOP. Um, other than that, uh, there's no bone formation, no heterotopic ossification that we've detected that occurs um, during um, prenatal uh, development. Uh, in addition to uh, this, this very characteristic um, uh, malformation of, uh, the, of the, um, 
of the great toe, there are other effects on the skeleton, other developmental effects that occur uh, to the skeleton, uh, although these tend to be a little bit more variable among, uh, among the patients. The ossification uh, begins early in life, usually before the age of five, uh, predicts in, uh, proceeds in relatively uh, predictable patterns. Uh, the first instances are usually in the upper back and neck area, and then progresses out through the limbs and down through the lower part of the body. Um, the lesion formation, or the uh, onset of bone formation, uh, is, is episodic. So it's not a continuous process, um, but it, it initiates uh, bone forms and matures, and then stops, and then another um, another wave of uh, bone formation can initiate. And these, these instances uh, of bone formation are relatively uh, unpredictable. Um, Preosseous swelling, inflammation, uh, generally uh, precedes the bone, uh, the bone formation. Uh, the, the bone, as I've said, occurs independently of, of the normal skeleton, so it's not just an, uh, an, an, exist, an extension from the uh, existing skeletal bone. You can see this bony ossicle here beneath uh, the heel of the foot. Um, and the um, uh, tissues that are affected are uh, soft connective tissue. Uh, usually, uh, most of the bone that we see forming is occurring in skeletal muscle, uh, but can also occur in uh, ten tendons and, and ligaments as well. Um, and this image here, I'll just point out that uh, the bone, again, going with the idea that the bone tissue that forms is, is normal bone. This is a piece of heterotopic uh, bone that has um, formed behind the knee, has fused into the skeleton, and has actually become the weight-bearing bone of the joint. Uh, in, in many cases, and this is an example, uh, the bone actually forms a, a marrow cavity. And as, as I said, it, uh, it forms um, uh, bone tissue that is very similar to, um, to skeletal bone. Um, the bone formation um, forms within the deep connective tissues, is progressive over time, um, and the disability is cumulative. Um, and this is uh, an example of a skeleton of a man who has uh, F FOP. This, this man actually lived in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, he passed away in his late 30s, uh, but asked that his skeleton be preserved and, and kept, um, and is actually um, um, housed at the um, Mütter Museum in the College of Physicians in, uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, one of the other um, things that we've learned about uh, FOP is that the bone formation um, always seems to occur by an endochondral mechanism and goes through uh, a series of, of events um, that are involved with uh, what I would describe as sort of a tissue destruction or tissue turnover. Um, this shows uh, an area of skeletal muscle with infiltration of inflammatory cells. Uh, a turnover or, or degradation of the existing uh, uh, skeletal muscle tissue. And then it's followed by uh, a rapid fibroproliferative response um, and then cells uh, differentiating into, um, into cartilage and bone. So going from a tissue destruction phase to a tissue formation phase. And when we first started studying FOP, we um, uh, got interested very quickly in uh, the BNP signaling pathway. It's known that uh, BNPs can induce the entire process of, uh, of bone formation when implanted um, into a tissue in an, in an animal model. Uh, and uh, we had done a series of uh, studies to show that BNP signaling was misregulated and upregulated um, in cells from, uh, from patients. Uh, this is a very tightly controlled uh, regulatory pathway and regulates a range of activities, not just bone formation, but is very important um, in um, just about every uh, tissue system and uh, developmental process. Uh, we eventually, after, after quite a long time, and many of you know the, know the saga, um, probably took us uh, uh, 15 years to um, generate or identify uh, 
five two-generation families that we used for a, a successful linkage analysis, uh, linked uh, FOP to a region on uh, chromosome two, and uh, a very uh, immediately a very promising candidate gene was a gene called ACVR1 or ALK2 that encodes a BMP type one receptor. Uh, we um, uh, through sequencing analysis of the ACVR1 gene, we found that uh, essentially that uh, every person who had a standard clinical presentation of FOP had exactly the same single nucleotide substitution. Um, this is a uh, nucleotide change that occurs in, um, in codon uh, 206 of the protein. And this amino acid is in the, um, uh, just inside the cytoplasmic domain of the receptor. So the type 1 receptor in complex with type 2 receptors will signal through BMP and um, when BMP binds the receptor complex. And this region here identified as the GS domain is phosphorylated in order to signal downstream. And codon 206 is in this uh, GS domain that's known to be very important in, um, in regulating signaling. We uh, did a series of studies uh, initially in, in vitro um, and uh, our group as well, well as other, other groups um, have found that um, the uh, mutation that we find in FOP patients causes a, a basal increase in signaling activity and that's indicated here in the luciferase reporter assay. This, this is uh, um, uh, activity uh, or response without uh, addition of BMP ligand and a similar type of assay looking for uh, pathway activation by SMAD phosphorylation. Wild type does not uh, activate the SMAD um, uh, um, molecules, but these are upregulated in, uh, in uh, cells containing the uh, FOP mutation. Uh, we've also uh, seen the same um, um, uh, result in cells that were isolated from, uh, from patients. Uh, because trauma, even trauma of a biopsy, can induce heterotopic ossification, um, uh, we, we do not biopsy once the di diagnosis has been made, but some very useful cells that, um, that uh, we have started to use are uh, cells that are isolated uh, from the dental pulp of, of teeth. So when kids lose their, uh, lose their baby teeth, they send them to us, we harvest the cells, and uh, those are the cells that uh, we we're able to use in, in this study. Um, and this together with our um, in vitro overexpression studies um, has led us to, um, uh, to determine that um, in the absence of BMP ligand, we seem to have uh, leaky low levels of uh, basal signaling from the pathway, but in response to BMP ligand, uh, there's hyperactivation of the signaling pathway. So definitely an, an activating uh, a, a mutation. Uh, one of the um, uh, 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 sort of lines of uh, work that we're very excited about has been development of a mouse model. So when you can't biopsy the patients and it's difficult to get uh, tissue samples uh, directly from patients to study, you become very dependent on, um, on animal models. And those models obviously were not possible until we um, identified the mutation. Um, so we have made a, um, uh, a knock-in mouse model containing the same mutation that we see uh, in patients. And what we found when um, the, uh, actually the first generation of mice, and these were just uh, chimeric mice that car uh, carried a mixture of both wild type and mutant cells, uh, what we saw uh, immediately was, was mice that had a truncation of the first digit on the hind limb. And like what we see in patients, this was very specific uh, for the hind limb. We don't see the first digit on the forelimb um, uh, that is, is malformed in this way. So if anybody has any, uh, any ideas about why uh, um, this mu mutation or, or an effect might be specific to hind limb versus forelimb, I'd be very interested in, uh, in talking with you more. 
Uh, we've also um, identified or, or analyzed uh, the skeleton of the mice, although the mice were, uh, all, other than the toe malformation, were perfectly normal, perfectly healthy at birth. Uh, by about six to eight weeks, they began to form heterotopic ossification, and you can see um, the, the newer bone is enhanced by the red color, and you can see masses of bone here that have fused into the skeleton. And um, uh, largely an analysis done uh, by my colleague Fred Kaplan, who many of you know, um, we compared the uh, phenotype of the mouse model with that of the patients, and uh, basically in every feature that we examined, the mouse is, uh, is an excellent model for, uh, for the disease. Um, we've done a series of uh, histological analyses looking for progression, and again, there are complete parallels um, of the stages of uh, heterotopic bone formation in the mouse model and, um, and patients. Uh, and also uh, as patients, and I didn't uh, emphasize this um, er earlier, uh, but in injury can induce the, um, the uh, occurrence of heterotopic ossification in uh, patients with this mutation, and the, um, the mice also uh, respond in this way. So a standard model that we use is to uh, uh, injure the mice by injection of cardiotoxin, and you can see um, a piece of bone that has formed here and higher magnification, and a cross-section here shows uh, the bone formation that has occurred. So uh, this is just a sort of laundry list of, you know, comparing uh, various features of, uh, of the human disease with the mouse disease, and I won't go through uh, each of the points, but um, as I said, uh, we were uh, quite happy that um, that the mouse was, uh, was a good model for, uh, for the disease. Uh, one uh, disappointment with, with the mouse is that uh, the mouse uh, actually responds to the mutation in a, a bit more severe way than patients. And so uh, a straight knock-in, um, uh, we've only on rare occasions had uh, germline transmission, and in those cases the mutation is perinatal lethal. So, uh, we uh, just have a new model coming online, a conditional uh, knock-in that will be able to, uh, to solve some of those uh, mouse model problems. So uh, this is just a summary of, uh, of what I've told you, a rare, rare disease uh, characterized by uh, embryonic skeletal malformations um, as well as uh, postnatal uh, heterotopic ossification. And uh, this disease is caused by uh, activating mutations uh, in a BMP type 1 receptor. How much time do I have? Five minutes. Okay. So I'm just very quickly going to tell you about the second disease that we study, um, uh, POH, progressive osseous heteroplasia. And we also, and we ac actually uh, started studying uh, this disease because patients were referred to us um, with a suspected diagnosis of, uh, of FOP. And, and Fred, uh, after not too long, he's a pretty sharp guy, um, you know, realized that they didn't quite fit into the same uh, clinical patterns that, uh, that um, most of the FOP patients were, uh, were falling in. Uh, these two diseases are similar in that there's progressive heterotopic ossification, uh, we occasionally have seen autosomal dominant uh, inheritance, but patients with FOP do not show toe malformations. Uh, the onset of bone formation is not associated with an inflammatory uh, response or, or swelling. Uh, the heterotopic ossification is more web-like. I'll show you that in a second. Um, and um, in almost and, and in most of the cases, and almost all of the biopsies that we've seen, the bone formation is intramembranous and not um, uh, um, uh, endochondral. And uh, very characteristic is uh, the initiation of the bone formation in the dermal layer of the skin, something that we never see in uh, patients uh, with FOP. Uh, so this is an example. You can see uh, the pebbly appearance of of the skin uh, with uh, bone forming um, 
uh, in the dermal layer. Uh, these affected areas uh, are distributed relatively randomly. We don't see the same kinds of uh, patterns of progression that we see in FOP. And this is a patient biopsy where you can see uh, the formation of bone just under the surface of the skin. And very often, this bone is associated with the dermal fat layer. Uh, this is a, um, a, a scan where you can see a bone that has formed here at the surface and then has progressed down into the deeper tissues through the skeletal muscle and is actually uh, fused with the, uh, with the femur. Um, and this gives you a pretty good illustration of the intramembranous bone formation. Um, it can be quite exp uh, extensive. This is a progressive series from the same patient, and this is actually an, uh, an amputation specimen. The, um, uh, the uh, bone became so extensive and fused into the skeletal bone. This is the tibia that continued to grow normally and, and is bowing out. So um, POH is really, really rare. Um, we only know uh, of about 50 to 60 patients um, that uh, have been confirmed to uh, have this condition. Um, and again, most cases uh, occur as um, spontaneous uh, mutations in a family. Um, because the disease is so rare, uh, a, a linkage analysis wasn't an option. So we took a candidate gene approach, and, and we were helped by this. Uh, by uh, a couple of other uh, rare disorders that are associated with dermal ossification. And in these uh, conditions, Albright hereditary osteodystrophy and pseudohypoparathyroidism 1A, uh, uh, ossification occurs in the dermal layer of the skin, just as we see in POH, but, does but generally does not progress down into the deeper tissues. And uh, studies had shown that uh, these two disorders are caused by uh, inactivating mutation uh, in a gene called GNAS. Um, we, of course, checked GNAS and, and did find uh, inactivating mutations in our patients as well. Uh, GNAS uh, encodes the um, alpha subunit of uh, stimulatory G protein of adenocyclase. And, um, couple signaling from a number of um, uh, seven transmembrane uh, uh, receptors at the cell surface um, to signal uh, a wide range of uh, pathways in the, in the cell. Probably uh, a key one that has been studied is uh, cyclic AMP. Uh, and we've uh, looked over the last uh, couple of years to try to address a hypothesis that there are progenitor cells within the dermal fat that um, can be um, uh, diverted in their uh, cell fate decision uh, by the presence of uh, GNAS activation. And um, in a recent series of, of experiments, we looked at the effect of the mutation on, um, on osteogenesis. This is using um, uh, 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 progenitor cells, at what we call um, um, ad adipose stromal cells from uh, fat tissue, and uh, we see that there's an enhanced um, uh, osteogenesis and rate of osteogenesis in cells containing the mutation and looking at uh, several markers of uh, uh, osteoblast differentiation, we see that these are enhanced in, uh, in the mutant cells as well. And then to complement that, um, a more recent study looked at adipogenesis, and we see just the opposite effect, that um, uh, GNAS inactivating mutations actually impair adipogenesis of the, um, of the adipose stromal cells. And again, uh, we see the uh, corresponding uh, decrease in, um, uh, in adipogenic markers in, in these cells. So, um, Progressive osseous heteroplasia is a very rare disorder. Uh, there are occasional uh, skeletal malformations that, that occur, although not to the extent that is seen in um, patients with all, Albright's and um, PHP1A. Um, and um, the heterotopic ossification very characteristically tends to progress from the superficial um, uh, tissues uh, um, in the dermis down to the um, deeper connective tissues. Uh, most patients that we've, had, uh, um, that we've ex examined, or I should say about 
two thirds to three quarters of, of the patients um, have a mutation in, in the GNAS gene, but we don't know what the mutations are in the, uh, in the remainder of, uh, of our patients. Uh, these mutations tend to be distributed throughout the gene. So uh, just in summary, in a com comparison of FOP and, and POH, there are uh, features that uh, are similar uh, between the two diseases, uh, but they are uh, clinically uh, very distinct and, and distinct from each other on a genetic level. Uh, one of the avenues of investigation that we're pursuing is how uh, the, the pathways interact, and, and we're very interested in uh, GNAS and what the signaling pathways are that uh, mediate the uh, downstream effects on, uh, on cell differentiation. So I think this is uh, uh, just, again, a, a summary. They're both distinct uh, genetic disorders, and um, hopefully our uh, work and, and others that become interested in these diseases will eventually lead to uh, new therapeutic strategies. Uh, and just to acknowledge um, uh, everybody in uh, our research group who has done all the work that I've uh, told you about, uh, and certainly uh, Fred Kaplan, uh, um, who has been my uh, uh, colleague and collaborator on everything that I've told you about and is is the person responsible for getting me interested in, in this work to begin with, and uh, Bob Pignolo, who uh, is another faculty member at, at Penn who, uh, who has uh, started to work with us. So um, thank you very much, and um, I don't know if there's time for questions. Yeah. We have time for just one question, uh, two, okay. So, um, y yes, if, if you block the, the inflammation, you, you, you can block heterotopic ossification. It's not quite so simple, and now that we have the mouse model, we'll be able to look a little bit more specifically at what those mechanisms may be and what, what's driving that. But I, I think it's pretty clear that, uh, that the inflammation is playing a big role in sort of uh, setting up the tissue or changing the tissue to allow this process to occur. Just one more question over there. Yeah, so um, for the, for the sake of time, I didn't go, go into this, but, but some of the mutations are exactly the same mutations. And in fact, we know, if, uh, um, and what seems to be the, uh, a, a key difference, and I think a very important difference, is uh, GNAS is imprinted. And so you, uh, uh, PHP and Albright's um, tend to be uh, inactivating mutations that, are, that occur in the maternally inherited copy of the gene. POH, almost with, without, well, without exception, seem to be, whenever we've been able to check, occur in the paternally inherited copy of the gene. Uh, it's a fairly complex locus. There are multiple transcripts, and so the suspicion is that some of the paternal uh, 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 paternally specific transcripts are involved in, in the process, um, and that's almost, almost certainly the case. And you'd be really interesting, in, in, interested. Um, there is one family that we know that um, has a mutation, and we can see a track through the family in one generation where all the affected individuals were uh, women, and they all have um, when the, they all have POH, and when they had children, their children all have um, Albright's. So, so the Im imprinting is definitely affecting the clinical phenotype, and that's where the hormone resistance seems to be associated, but I think is also an, an important factor with the ossification as well. Thank you very much. Okay, the second speaker, we, we must move on. The second speaker is Mauricio Pasifici from the Philadelphia, 
and uh, he's going to talk us about uh, multiple hereditary exostosis. Actually, the MHC has been a continuous theme of this uh, symposium from the beginning of the first time. And, uh, he's, he's going to talk about the pathogenic mechanism and the prospects for therapy. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, you. Uh, Jose, thank you so much. This is a terrific uh, uh, symposium, I learned so much. Uh, and as you heard from, uh, so thank you for the invitation, it's really an honor to be here. As, as you heard from uh, Peter Byers, uh, it's really tough to come to San Diego <laughs> from the East Coast, uh, cold and so beautiful, the, the, the sunshine is just gorgeous. And, um, uh, by the way, uh, so he, his remark about first cousins <laughs> brought, brought back a memory which I completely forgot, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> so my, uh, uh, I had one first cousin, she, she was really beautiful. And my, my expression must have been so obvious that I remember distinctly my, my grandmother, my mom's mom, one day she just blew up and she goes, just stop it, just marry her. <laughs> so, Italians are not very subtle. We're not very, we're not very subtle people. So, you know, we just, uh, just, anyway. Um, so I'm going to tell you about the MHE, um, uh, multiple uh, hereditary estostosis, and I'm gonna talk about the pathogenic mechanism in mice. So unfortunately we have anything in humans, unfortunately, as yet. And I will leave the prospect for therapies only if you ask me. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna venture too much into that. So MHG, uh, which is also known as MO, uh, multiple estochondroma, or HME, uh, same disease. Auto, uh, uh, auto, uh, autosomal dominant is about the frequency is about one in fifty thousand. Uh, is diagnosed at birth or early postnatal life, so it's considered a birth defect by definition. And it's characterized by this, uh, this exostosis, which are benign tumors, uh, but also uh, several other problems, including uh, uh, chronic pain, deform skeletal deformations, wound healing problems. And you can see the exostosis sticking out here from the, from, you know, the lung bones. Uh, they can be in the pelvis, they can be in the ribs, they can be in the spinal, uh, in the spine. Uh, and they are b benign, but unfortunately they transition to malignancy, about two to three percent in the patients, they become osteosarcomas, and then things are really, uh, you know, they can be uh, life-threatening, and often they are. So, uh, why are we interested in this? Not only for the disease, but there is the biology behind, and that's what we are trying to understand, the biology behind it, the pathogenesis, and try to figure out whether there is anything we could do to stop uh, this disease, and in particular, the estostosis. So they are cartilaginous outgrowth, and they form next to, but never within the growth plates. And some benign tumors or cartilage actually form within the growth plates. This estosis is formed next to, but never within. So there is a topography that we are trying to figure out. What's the, what's the reg regulation of the topography of this estostosis? Why does it form here? And because they form here, they interrupt this magic uh, border between the growth plate and the perichondrium, which is normally uninterrupted, so they stick out and interrupt uh, the border. So uh, 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 th this disease has been studied for many, many years. This is a review article from Jeff Esco, who's back there, uh, one of my collabor collaborators, also with Yu Yamaguchi. Uh, and uh, there are about a thousand uh, mutations now known in these two genes. Uh, EXT1 and EXT2, they are all lots of functional mutation. Most of them are uh, nonsense, some are missense. <clears throat> and these two uh, genes code for these two uh, glycophil transferases in the Golgi that co-polymerize heparin sulfate. And so therefore, since the patients are heterozygous for EXT1 and EXT2, uh, they have a, a, a heparin sulfate deficiency throughout the body, probably about 50% of normal levels. <laughs> So why is this uh, a problem? Well, as uh, in this review that also <coughs> Jeff Esco published a few years ago, uh, heparin sulfate <coughs> regulates so many numerous uh, pro uh, physiological processes that when you have a deficiency, in theory, 
most of these processes could be affected. And the one that we are paying most attention is the fact that the balance of phase product ligands bind to signaling proteins, absolutely key regulators of essentially anything, hedgehogs, BMPs, FGS, WINs, and they regulate distribution and activity on target cells. So again, a deficiency in abundance of phase could alter these processes. And this is where most of our work is now centered. So um, every time I give this talk, I change the, the, the question because there are so many. And, but today I'm gonna try to focus on this two one here and leave this for later. So how do heterozygous ESC mutation, HSC deficiency, lead to astrosis formation? So what's the, me the mechanism? And what do astrocytosis form, to, uh, form next to, but not within the growth plates? Uh, so uh, uh, regarding the first one, so when uh, uh, Spikens, uh, uh, Jeff, and Gina Werb uh, uh, produced these mice, uh, they tried to mimic the, the human condition. They made just heterozygous uh, mutant mice in ST1 and ST2, but to their surprise, the mice were largely normal and only about 15% had developed an estostosis here and there, and these estostosis were only in the ribs, were often solitary, and depending on the gen genetic background of the mice. So they were really not mimicking MHE as yet with this, uh, just uh, this. So what we did, uh, uh, again, collaboration with Jeff Esco, we said, okay, how about double hetero? Why did we say double hetero? Because the, since the two enzymes are required for HS synthesis, we predicted that the double heads will produce less HS, evidence of phase, and single heads, and this might actually mimic much more closely the human condition. And the answer was yes. In fact, these double heads really mimic very much MHE. They have multiple estostosis, they have in the ribs, many. They also they have really stereotypic estostosis in long bones, uh, which is one of the most uh, frequently uh, sites affected in the disease. And in fact, they have even two types of estostosis, which are similar to the one we see in human, uh, in patients, which is the typical estostosis, which is a growth plate-like structure, oriented at 90 degrees uh, compared with the long axis. So the growth plate, the normal growth plate is in this direction. Estostosis always go in this direction, which is another puzzle. <clears throat> and also they have some estostosis that look like transition to malignancy. So we're really, uh, and in fact, these ab double heads uh, have many more estrosis than single heads, and the frequency is almost uh, twice as much. So in this paper that uh, uh, Yu Yamaguchi uh, published uh, a couple of years ago, two and a half years ago, what they did, they went on to the next step, which is they create conditional EXT ablation. Uh, uh, and, and in fact, what they found, uh, one, once you conditionally ablate the XT1, uh, not throughout the organism, otherwise the mouse would not exist. So uh, mice cannot exist without the XT1 and XT2. So they have to be conditional. And in this case, they found 100% penetrance, uh, uh, as you can see uh, in many places here. Uh, and the, this con condition of knockout was done with CO2 pre ER and CO2 direct uh, CRE activity in chondrocytes. And so, the, in part, we have begin, begun to answer this, this first question what's the, the relationship between these uh, mutations and, and estrosis formation? Because clearly, at least in patients, it is, appears to be the single heterozygous ES1 estrosis mutation in patients might not be sufficient to trigger multiple estostosis. And estostosis formation is inversely related to XT function. So the more XT function you lose, the more estostosis you're gonna get. And, <clears throat> and uh, therefore, we are trying to figure out uh, how this relates to the pathogenesis in, in patients. <clears throat> uh, uh, let me tell you a little bit about this, uh, why, why this estostosis uh, uh, grow next to the, the growth plate. And so our hypothesis was that since they, they form next to, but not within the growth plate, might be the, the pathogenesis of the estostosis involves perichondrium. <clears throat> and it might be, it might also involve uh, uh, ectopic signaling by prochondrogenic factors. So if there is prochondrogenic factor ectopic in perichondrium, perichondrium might be responsible, at least in part, for estostosis formation. And the answer to this uh, question seems to be affirmative to both of them. So we conditionally eliminated the ST1 
in the epithelial perichondrium using this uh, transgenic mouse here, this GDFI3. And as you see by Rosa staining, the, there is a activity of, of three recombinase along the perichondrium located in the epithesis. And sure enough, when we did that, astrocytosis began to appear. So this is the border between perichondrium and, and growth plate in, in the control mouse, perfect border, no interruption. And in this uh, knockout, the condition of knockout, as you can see, they begin to be this little, this little exostosis, and a few days later, they become much more apparent. <coughs> and we were able to, to uh, continue to understand the, the, the part, uh, what was behind this. And so in this experiment, these are EXT flux flux long bones from mice in a splunk culture, and what, uh, we, we ablated EXT by adeno three. So just adding adeno to the medium, and this is the, the location of adeno uh, G, 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 GFP, it shows you that the virus is all over the place. Uh, and uh, sure enough, in this, in this model, the border between perichondrium and, and, and growth plate is intact in the controls, but in the adeno treated, treated uh, as, as specimens, as you can see, you begin to see ectopic uh, formation of, of cartilages, this an estostosis like, uh, like tissue. And interestingly, even though the virus was all over the place, in, over the entire length of the bones, uh, the formation of this exostosis like tissue actually was mostly confined to the upper epithesis. <coughs> and uh, we, we went to look both in vivo and in vitro in organ culture, whether there might be ectopic BMP signaling, why BMP signaling, you heard from Eileen just a moment ago, BMP is a major prochondrogenic factors. So if there is a, 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 a activation of ectopic cartilage formation, probably there is a, a ectopic activation of BMP signaling, and the answer to this is also yes. So both in vivo and in vitro, uh, the, the perichondrium in, in control is negative for uh, phosphorus MADs, which are the, the mediators of BMP signaling, but in the, in the knockout, either in, in vivo, or in organ culture with the adeno three, you see ectopic uh, uh, BMP signaling uh, all along the perichondrium. And this change precedes by about 24 hours to 48 hours the formation of, of uh, 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 cartilage. Now we actually, uh, uh, years ago, this was in 2007, we published this paper and in which we were uh, looking at Indian edge which is another major prochondrogenic factor. And what we found in this particular mouse model, which has not much to do with, with the MHE, but it was very, very informative, what we found was that, uh, that um, uh, in this knockout, the Indian edge uh, uh, went, uh, was uh, re relocated all along the perichondrium. So this is the distribution of Indian edge in, in wild sites. And in this mutant, it was, uh, was uh, uh, Indian edge proteins was all re redistributed all along the perichondrium this led to ectopic signaling of EDGOG because we were mon monitoring one of the targets of, of EDGOG, which is uh, patch it one And sure enough, a, a few days later, a, a cartilage appears. Okay, so again, here is the border. This is the wild type, growth plate, perichondrium, perfectly intact. Uh, a few days later, after we activate this, uh, this mutation, boom, we get ectopic uh, uh, cartilage formation following the redistribution of a jog. And uh, we went on uh, to uh, just uh, do this uh, experiment in the last few months. And so what we did just to confirm what I just uh, showed you, we made this triple transgenic mouse. So this is the XT1 flux flux, got to three ER, and, and GLE1 like this. GLE1 like this is a hedgehog signaling reported mouse line. And this allowed us to show that in fact the formation of this uh, ectopic uh, cartilage, here, as you can see here, this <coughs> estrostosis like this, uh, is accompanied by the redistribution of edge jaw because this is, a, as you can see, the very, very strong uh, uh, GLE-1 activity here in the perichondrium uh, in the mutant, but not in the wild types. So we got to this point, we began to do experiment in vitro to understand a little bit more the, the, the mechanics of, of these changes. And as you, as you now are uh, it's obvious that what's happening in this disease is that if we inhibit heparin sulfate 
or we lose EXP1 expression, we actually gain chondrogenesis. So the loss of heparin phosphate EXP1 is the, you get the opposite response. So what, what's the relation with this inhibition and the stimulation? So what we did was uh, uh, just take uh, this uh, mouse embryo limba uh, cells, and this is one of the most favorite chondrogenic system in the world. So you just take mesenchyme from limbad, from mouse embryos, you put them in vitro, and they undergo spontaneous chondrogenesis. So the, the, these uh, embryos were EXT flux flux, and what we were able, therefore, to do is treat them with adeno-3 to knock out uh, EXT uh, from expression, or we simply treated these cultures with heparanase, or we treated them with sorfen, which is a NHS antagonist. We just wanted to do three methods to see whether we would get the same result. So in all these situations, either we knock out the gene with adeno-3, or we treat the cells with heparanase, which will destroy heparan sulfate, or we treat them with sorfen, which is HS antagonist, the answer was always the same. We boost we boost chondrogenesis. So once again, loss of heparin sulfate, loss of EXP gene expression, much, much more chondrogenesis. And this was accompanied by, obviously, all the genes for chondrogenesis that go up many folds. Uh, so we want uh, a little bit more in detail to try to uh, understand what was happening. Uh, so we this is, uh, uh, just pay attention to this panel here. These are, uh, this is a reporter assay. So these are the same cells I showed you before, but transfected with the luciferase uh, 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 BMP signaling uh, reporter uh, um, um, plasmid. And uh, what, we, what, we, what we found was, uh, so this is the level in the control cells. I just have it here in bigger and bigger. So, so if, you, if you take, these are the control cells. So again, this is BMP signaling activity in the ordinate. Uh, so this is the level in the control cells. If we treat them with BMP2 from outside, obviously BMP signal goes up, as you will predict. Interestingly, we got the same level of activity if we treat them with sorfen. So we block a chest activity, a BMP signal goes up as much as treating the cells with, with BMP2, and when we obviously combine these two, we get uh, you know 20-fold increase in, in, in activity. So we also monitor uh, uh, BMP signaling, and if you look at p uh, bad, uh, they go up very, very quickly as soon as the cells are treated with sulfan or we treat them in the other methods I, I told you before, either adeno-3 or heparanase. So the cells are very quickly responding to this loss of heparan sulfate function or EXP expression, and they increase chondrogenesis. And interestingly, not only they are uh, 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 signaling more, they are actually gene expressing more BMP2 uh, and the two receptors for, B, uh, for, for BMP. So everything is being boosted up by the cells in response to this loss of, of heparin sulfate or loss of, of, of EXP uh, function. <coughs> um, so I just have two or three more slides. Um, so in uh, uh, two or three years ago, this paper came out, which uh, really caught our attention. <coughs> and I have to say, as it has not been, as far as I know, this data has not been repeated by anybody. We are trying now to actually do it ourselves. So we're just collecting uh, human specimens. <coughs> and so uh, uh, what this uh, group reported, that in this human HME, MHE patients, if you just prepare sections of their cystosis, and you look for heparanase, in endogenous heparanase, uh, it's much, much, much more evident in the, in, the, in the pathological tissue than control. Okay, in control, there is nothing. These controls are pieces of ribs, these are humans, so whatever the doctors uh, uh, gave them. And interesting, they took cells out of this uh, uh, MHG uh, uh, masses of, of tissue, get, uh, got, uh, obtain a surgery, and somehow they also got normal chondrocytes from also donors. And they claim that, in fact, they confirmed what I just showed you before, that the MHG uh, chondrocytes have much more heparanase uh, than the, the, the control cells. 
this is endogenous enzyme. <coughs> and so uh, um, uh, Julianne, the, the, who's doing all this work in, in, with us, uh, she actually tried to do this, uh, sort of tried to figure out whether this is the same uh, in our system. So uh, these are the mouse condogenesis in, in vitro that I showed you before. And she simply treated it with sorfen, uh, as I showed you before, or she knocked out EXP uh, by adenofreeze. In all these cases, she got about, uh, usually it's one or two-fold increase in heparanase gene expression, both RNA and protein, uh, protein level. Okay, so again, you lose heparan sulfate, actually the cells respond by making heparanase, okay? <coughs> So this is my last slide, well, one more, just the acknowledgement. Uh, so this is roughly where we are moving towards. So we think that the uh, formation of estostosis is caused by these three uh, major changes. First, because you are losing abran sulfate, there is an unrestricted distribution and overactivity of signaling factors, mostly prochondrogenic factors, BMPs and hedgehogs, as I showed you before. The second is that because the cells are HS deficient, actually they become even more responsive to the BMP and HOG. <clears throat> and third, I showed you before, this has to be confirmed in the patient that there might be a positive prochondrogenic loop involving endogenous separanase. <clears throat> so it's, it's, if you could think about these three combined systems really lower as much as possible, they, have, they control the amount of heparan sulfate and, and really increase dramatically probably the responsiveness of the, of the cells to these factors and therefore uh, inducing uh, ectopic chondrogenesis <coughs> and uh, uh, SSOSIS formation. Okay, so um, uh, this is Children's Hospital in Philadelphia <coughs> at night time. Um, and uh, most of what I showed you was done by Julian Hugo, who's a graduate student, Federica Sgarilla, who's a postdoc with my wonderful colleagues and our uh, chief, John Dormant. Uh, uh, almost everything I've showed you was done in collaboration with Jeff Esco at USSD and, and Yu Yamaguchi uh, here. Uh, and uh, we thank the Nayans for uh, giving us a good amount of money to do all this. Thank you so much. <coughs> Time for probably a couple of questions. Jeff? I guess convincing. <coughs> like you, when you look at surgical specimens or you look in the knockout mice, if you stain for the levels of heparin sulfate in the tissue, they're much more dramatically affected than what you would predict based on cell culture experiments where EXP is, um, where one copy of EXP is deleted. So I just wonder, in fact, if, if your induction of heparinase now is, is partially explaining that over accentuation with loss of, of HS in the growth plate region. Yes, so th that, that's actually, that's why we, we, we followed up that study because it would offer the, an, an additional possibility of why, why is the tissue, uh, why are the cells so deficient of a brand of and why are they so responsive to, to this? Yes, so, so that would offer. Yes, so as soon as we, if, if once we confirm the human data and we confirm also the mouse data, uh, then we were gonna go ahead and do the double transgenic mouse because the heparan, the heparan, heparan is knockout mouse has essentially no phenotype, which is great. And so we're just gonna combine, if that enzyme has a role, then the mice should be more resistant uh, to, to induction of estostosis formation. If that's the case, then we have a genetic proof that in fact this gene might be necessary for the for induction of estostosis. So we just, but we are, we're not gonna do it unless we assure that it might work. Yes. Yeah, so, the, so this, is, this is extremely controversial uh, uh, in, in this uh, uh, field. So uh, a few patients have been found to be, very, very few patients have been found to be double hetero by the mice. And also some patients, if you look at as a single, single lesion, so a single estostosis, and you, uh, 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 you just focus on that, not the peripheral blood, 
it appears that some of these exosomes might be a, a loss of heterozygosity. Okay, but uh, 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 so it would be a local event. The, the point is to explain, you know, some of these children have 100 different exosomes. So it's so, sort of a, a hard to believe that this is a, uh, um, um, you know, the only mechanism. But in fact, other people uh, suggest that they don't see it. Okay, thank so, you. So the second hit, the second hit is probably there, but it's not clear what it might be. It could be a loss of heterozygosis. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.